Our second scripture today is a challenging one. It comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his lord ordered to him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payments to be made. So the slave fell on his knees and before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii and seized him by the throat. He said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into the prison until he would pay his debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked slave. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. I think one of the things I miss most wearing a mask all the time is being able to tell when people are smiling at you. I was smiling at you. Okay. You <laughs> <laughs> <Thank> you, <Jenny. laughs> Nobody thought much about the front porch when most Americans had them and used them, so says California architect Davida Roshlin. The great American front porch, she says, was just there. Historian Scott Clark adds this. The front porch, in essence, was an outdoor living room where the family could retire after the activities of a long day. I asked in the first service how many people grew up doing that, retiring after, yeah, that was true for the first service as well. It was an outdoor living room where the family could retire after the acti activities of a long day in the evenings as the outdoor air provided a cool alternative to the stuffy indoor temperatures. The entire family would move out to the front porch. The children might play in the front yard or the friendly confines of the neighborhood while the parents rocked in their chairs. The front porch, he says, existed as a zone between the public and the private, an area that could be shared between the sanctity of home and the community outside. It was an area where interaction with the community could take place. It fostered a sense of community and neighborliness. The porch, he says, brought the neighborhood together. By forcing interaction and an acute awareness of others. So something inside me bristles at his word choice, forcing interaction. But you can't argue with the point that he's making. In the heyday of the American front porch, everybody was outside. You couldn't help but interact when everybody was outside. And you couldn't help but be aware of what was going on with your neighbors. You know, you try not to be Snoopy, but you hear things. <laughs> I'm certainly not the first one to say this, but something was lost when we all moved inside. Or when we all moved to our back decks. We are not engaging with each other the way we used to. We aren't connecting. 
We aren't interacting. We aren't trusting. We aren't sharing the way we used to, like we did from our front porches. And I believe that we have paid a price. Eureka is somewhat shielded from this, Washburn too, uh, somewhat shielded from this, but not entirely. For it seems to me that in American society today, we have lost a sense of community. In his classic 19th century work, Democracy in America, French historian and political scientist Alexis de Tocqueville writes this about our human tendency to turn inward. And it's amazing to me. He wrote this in like 1835-ish, and the words are so relevant today. Hear this. Each person, withdrawn and apart, is like a stranger to the destiny of others. His children and his particular friends form the whole of the human species for him. As for dwelling with his fellow citizens, he is beside them, but he does not see them. He touches them, but he does not feel for them. He exists only in himself and for himself alone. And yet, when we do interact with each other front porch style, with that forced interaction and acute awareness of others, de Tocqueville says, feelings and ideas are renewed. The heart is enlarged and the understanding developed only by the reciprocal action of men one upon another. It seems to me we all need enlarged hearts in America today. <laughs> Not in the cardiovascular sense, in the Christian sense, in the front porch sense. It seems to me we need enlarged hearts here. We need to see each other, not merely be beside each other. We need to feel for each other, not merely bump up against each other. We need to renew our feelings for each other, our understanding too, and our reciprocity. What we need is front porch living, where everyone is a neighbor, where we know each other and pass the time together where we are open and amiable and aware and engaged with each other. Blogger Brian Jones says that the front porch is potential ground for calling us outside ourselves. The front porch is potential ground for calling us outside ourselves. This is what we need, I think. We need to be called outside ourselves. We need to take on a front porch mentality, actually more than a mentality. I think we need to become portable front porches. <laughs> portable front porches who respond to all our neighbors those we know, and even those we don't know. Remember, Jesus had a very broad definition of neighbor. Portable front porches who respond to all our neighbors with gracious hospitality and welcome. Portable front porches who carry the love and grace of Christ with us wherever we go. Portable front porches who reclaim the holy ground that exists between human hearts when the Christ in me greets the Christ in you. Portable front porches where we reclaim the holy ground where human heart meet, hearts meet and the Christ in me greets the Christ in you. Welcome back to our September worship series based on Harper Leaves. Lee's beloved novel, To Kill a Mockingbird. I asked in the first service how many people reread it in preparation for this, and two people raised their hands, both librarians. <laughs> Did anybody else reread this in preparation? Yay! <laughs> 
So I promised last week that I would explain our front porch worship arts display today. As you just heard, this is um, not merely a set piece, although we did want to evoke 1930s Maycomb, Alabama with this. Um, Many thanks to Janet Wilkins' parents for the rocking chair and the butter churn. Um, I guess that's it from your parents. And the screen door is courtesy of Heidi and Marty Lynch and also Jim and Karen Fike because they live in the same house where they used to live. Jim, in fact, painted this screen door low these many years ago. It's a special thing here. So this was certainly meant to evoke um, 1930s Maycomb, Alabama. Um, But these aren't just pretty decorations. This front porch scene is a metaphor for us. It's a metaphor for you and me. We are not meant to hide out behind closed doors, even the closed doors of our hearts. We are not meant to live cut off from our neighbors. I was telling them in the first service, I've told you this before, but the neighborhood we lived in in Fort Worth before we moved here, everybody has privacy fences, like six-foot fences. You cannot see over them unless you're, you know, Mark. You can't see over these, these fences, um, and it's an alley kind of neighborhood. So you pull, in your, you pull in the alleyway, and you get to your driveway, which is cut off from everybody else's driveway by these privacy fences, and you push your little button, and you drive in, and you push the little button, and you're in your house. And the way the houses are constructed, the windows that you do have don't overlook other people's houses. They overlook a bush or your backyard <laughs> or, or your front yard. They don't, they don't look into the neighbors. And so we were in that house weeks. I think it was six weeks before I even caught a glimpse of our neighbors. This is not the way we are intended to be. We are not intended to dwell behind privacy fences, not ever seeing each other. We are not meant to live cut off from our neighbors. Those single stories we looked at last week, those boxes that we keep each other in, they are a direct result, I think, of this hold-up mentality where we do not know each other. And they are not what God intends. But front porch living? That is where the call is. God expects us. God requires us. What does the Lord require of us? God requires us to step outside ourselves and engage with the world. God expects us to present our bodies, our hearts, our wills, our lives as living front porches, interacting with the world Christ style. Christ style, which means doing justice and loving kindness, and walking humbly with our God. This is what we will explore in the remaining weeks of this series, Christ-style front porch living. Today we consider what it means to do justice. We think we know what the word justice means. At least most of us probably have a vague idea in our heads, even if we've never really sat down to write out a definition Justice, ah, oh, yes, we so, say, and immediately one of the millions of episodes of Law and Order floods through our minds and we hear the dun dun, you know, from the show. Like, this is what we think of when we hear the word justice, the sound effect ringing in our ears. But as a people living under God's expectations, as a people living under God's requirements, what we think the word justice means is irrelevant. Because what matters is how God understands justice. And we catch a glimpse of how God understands justice in this parable from Matthew chapter 18. Jesus begins his story. A king is settling accounts with his slaves. He looks at the books and notices that one slave owes him 10,000 talents. This may seem like a large amount to our ears. We hear it like dollars. Oh yeah, $10,000, that is a lot. But what we miss is that this is an absolutely ridiculously absurd amount of money. One talent equaled what a laborer could earn in 15 years. One talent 
equaled what a laborer could earn in 15 years. To put it in dollars, let's say you earn $35,000 a year. Owing one talent, just one, would mean that you would owe $525,000. Owing 10,000 talents, that's $5.25 billion with a B. <laughs> a ridiculously absurd amount of money. This slave has no chance of paying it back. At first, the king's response is harsh. Sell this slave along with his family and all of his possessions. Never mind that that wouldn't even come close to the amount owed. But then the slave falls to his knees and begs. Have patience with me, Lord, and I will pay everything. Again, never mind that this is an idle promise. He could never repay it all. But the king is moved. Out of pity for him, Jesus says. That word pity is spectacular in Greek. I did it okay in the first service, so here we go. Splunk nizomai. <laughs> Splunk nizomai. I think we should play Scrabble in Greek. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> Splunk nizomai. It does mean to have pity, but we miss how vivid this word is since we don't speak Greek. What splunk nizomai literally means is to be moved in our, shall I say, inward part to use a polite southern way of saying vowels, <laughs> which marks the second time I've said that word in a sermon counting this morning. <laughs> Splunk nizomai means to be moved in our gut. Splunk nizomai means to be punched in the gut. It's not merely to have petty, pity, it's to be punched in the gut. This king is moved with pity. Seeing this man's despair, Seeing his desperation, seeing his suffering, seeing his fear, the king is punched in the gut. And so the king in Jesus' story does something unexpected. Actually, he says to the slave, I'll just cancel the whole debt. You don't owe me a thing. This is absolute forgiveness. This is excessive mercy. This is grace with a capital G. So how does the slave respond to such amazing grace? Not as you'd expect. He goes out from the king, probably still in shock. I think my knees would be a little bit wobbly. He goes out from the king and immediately runs into a fellow slave who owes him a hundred denarii. To use our dollar example, if we're talking about an annual income of $35,000, 100 denarii would be pushing $10,000. So not an insignificant amount by any means. But nothing compared to the debt that has just been forgiven. The first slave seizes his debtor by the throat, Jesus says. A chokehold, Jesus says. The first slave seizes this man by the throat and spits out these words, pay me what you owe. The man falls to his knees. The man makes the same plea. Have patience with me and I will pay you. The first slave does not hear the echo of his own words here. To paraphrase de Tocqueville, the first slave is beside this man, but he does not see him. He touches him, but he does not feel for him. The first slave exists only in himself and for himself alone. There is no punch to the gut in the face of his despair. There is no punch to the gut in the face of his desperation or his suffering or his fear. The first slave throws the man in prison until the debt may be repaid. And when the fellow slaves see this, they report him to the king. The king summons the first slave again. 
You wicked slave, he cries out. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave? As I had mercy on you? In righteous anger, then, the king hands the slave over to be tortured until he repays the entire debt, which, as we have just established, would be never. The king hands the slave over to be tortured for the rest of his life, and then Jesus ends his story with this zinger. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Yowza. You are right. This is a hard story. So what do we learn about God's justice from this story? We learn that it is excessive in mercy. We learn that it is abundantly overflowing with forgiveness. We learn that it is patient. Have patience with me, the slave begs. Patience, macrothumia in Greek, patience, the same word we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. Love is patient, same word. Which means, from this story, we learn that God's justice is dun -dun, love. If I had asked you to get a piece of paper out at the beginning of this service and write a definition of justice on that piece of paper, I can pretty much guarantee that none of us would have thought of love. And yet, this is what we learn from this story. God's justice is love. God looks upon us debtors with love. God looks upon us debtors and sees our despair, our desperation, our suffering, our fear, our imperfection. And looks upon us with love. In love, God is moved with pity. Splunk knees, oh my. God looks upon us, and because God loves us so, God feels a punch to the gut. But, and this is the fearsome thing. We also learn from the lips of Jesus himself that this excessively merciful, forgiving, patient, loving justice is not unconditional. For God expects us, requires us, God expects us, requires us to respond to one another with the same excessively merciful, forgiving, patient, loving justice. God expects us, requires us to feel a punch to the gut whenever we see another's despair. God expects us, requires us to feel a punch to the gut whenever we see another's desperation. God expects us, requires us to feel a punch to the gut when we see another suffering. When we see another's fear. Christians, do you hear? God's requirements are fierce. In his Faith of a Mockingbird, which is our guide for this series, pastor and author Matt Raleigh offers this summary of Tom Robinson's story in To Kill a Mockingbird. Tom Robinson is an African-American day laborer who lives a quiet life until he is accused of raping Mayella Ewell, a young white woman. Tom's trial dominates most of the drama within To Kill a Mockingbird. As the trial unfolds, the evidence seems to suggest not only that Tom is innocent of the crime, but that Bob Ewell, Mayella's father, 
orchestrated the entire affair in order to hide the shame of his daughter's attraction to Tom. Ultimately, Raleigh writes, the evidence is not strong enough to overcome the jury's assumptions, their single story of Tom Robinson like we talked about last week. The evidence is not strong enough to overcome the jury's assumptions, and Tom is pronounced guilty and led away with little hope of an appeal. Tom's difficult journey ends, Raleigh writes, when soon after being taken to jail, he is killed in an alleged attempt to escape. The fact that he was shot 17 times only adds to the suspicion that many saw Tom's fight for justice as a threat to their social system, Raleigh writes, and wanted him dead, regardless of the truth of his guilt. And then Raleigh writes this, though not an autobiography, Many people, places, and events in To Kill a Mockingbird are based on Harper Lee's hometown of Monroeville, Alabama, and the things she experienced growing up there. And then Raleigh says this. The abrupt ending to Tom's story was intended to jar us enough to serve as a catalyst for change. It seems, he's arguing, that Harper Lee purposely put the period in the wrong place as a means of calling us to complete the story. She seems to be asking, and now what will you do about it? Christians, this call, this claim that God has put upon us to work for justice is alive and well today. God expects us, requires us to step outside ourselves and engage with the hurts of the world. God expects us, requires us to feel that punch to the gut whenever we see despair. Whenever we see desperation, whenever we see suffering, whenever we see fear, God expects us, requires us to respond with mercy and forgiveness and patience and love. This is what it means to present ourselves as living sacrifices, to present ourselves as living front porches. This is what it means to stand on the holy ground that exists between human hearts when the Christ in me greets the Christ in you. This is what it means to interact with the world Christ style. So now, Christians, what are we going to do about it? <laughs>